I like that late, late good morning. That was good. I'm so glad to be here with you. Listen, you don't know the joy of being in Missouri uh, knowing that you're missing two hurricanes from where you just came from. Uh, <laughs> it, it is a blessing. And so please pray for my friends and family that are where we used to be. And please pray that my roof stays on so my house still gets sold. Oh, uh, so... Wonderful, we're glad to be here. If you got your Bibles, I want to ask you to open to Nehemiah. We're going to find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to cover chapter 6 through 9 today. Uh, That's a lot of chapters we're covering. You're welcome. It's going to be good. I want to just, Chris and I want to thank uh, everyone so much. Your prayers and just calls and texts have been such a blessing the past few weeks. We moved into our our rental in Hillsboro. Thank you, everyone that came out and helped us move and contacted us. Uh, we want to just give an extra special thank you uh, to the Wakirkas who let us stay in their house. And while it was such a blessing, it was just such a stressful time for me because the entire time we were there in, in, at their place, the whole time I thought about was my children were going to burn their place down. <laughs> and so I was really glad they didn't. So thankful uh, for y'all and, and for helping us and everything. I, I, I want to encourage you, as always, we share the gospel. And I, and I, I want to tell you, and, and I'm going to encourage you to share the gospel. I encourage our staff to share the gospel. I want to encourage our, our deacons and our ministry leaders to share the gospel. And so I, I want to share the gospel every week. And this week I was really happy I was able to uh, share the gospel, share Jesus with the uh, U-Haul lady yesterday and just tell her what God had been doing in my life. Didn't have a lot of time to do a whole lot of the whole pitch, but I was able just to tell of what Jesus was doing in my life. And sometimes that's all you got time to do is just tell what Jesus is doing in your life. But I want to encourage you as we walk together, as this faith family comes together, as we grow up in disciples, we grow up into maturity in Christ Jesus, we want to do so in telling others and being disciples who make disciples. And I want to encourage you every single time, every single chance you get, every single day, every single week that you go out into the world, look for people. Leave this place as sent ones going out into the world, sharing what Jesus has done in your life. And I want to also encourage you to attend Sunday school. Part of being a Christian, part of being a disciple and growing is Sunday school. We we have Sunday school. That is our mode. That is part of our discipleship pathway here at First Baptist. And we have an 815, and right now we have an 11. We're going to switch that up. And I, I know it may be just irking your nerves a little bit that we're moving your Sunday school around, but I want you to think of it as a good thing. Now... You have no reason not to invite friends, family, neighbors, and strangers to come to church because we're going to have room to sit them. Amen? I'm an amen myself. That's a good thing. So I want to encourage you. Think, don't think of it as, as, as a bad thing. Think of it as a good thing. God is doing good things here at First Baptist in our faith family. He's making it a way. He's provided us this wonderful facility through your faithfulness and giving and serving and loving people. He's going to allow us to have a second worship service so we can bring more people in safely to hear the message of the cross. That's a good thing, church. That's a good thing. I got to quit these introductions that aren't introductions. I just get so excited when I get to tell you about what God is doing and what he's going to do. So we have our Bibles in Nehemiah chapter 6. Wilma was born prematurely, and as a result, she contracted double pneumonia twice, scarlet fever, and suffered from polio, which left her with a crooked left leg and a twisted foot. For over six years, she wore metal braces and did physical therapy, but young Wilma determined was determined not to allow her disability to mess with her dreams. By age 11, she had decided to believe, and through much pain and through much failure, she forced herself to learn how to walk without braces, and by age 12, she learned how to run. One day, she built up enough courage to go ask the the high school basketball coach. She said, if you would just give me 10 minutes a day, I will give you a world-class athlete, and the result was history. She began to run track, and then she beat her friend, Then she beat all the girls on her team. Then she beat all the girls in her high school. Then she beat all the girls in the state to at 14 years old won the state championship. In 1956, she ran and won the bronze in the 440 meter relay at the Olympics, but that was not good enough for her. 
She started college at Tennessee State University, and for over 1,200 days, she would get up at 6 and run. She'd run again at 10. She'd run at 3 in the afternoon, and she'd sneak out her dorms to run between 8 and 10 at night. For 1,200 days, she kept this up. She arrived in Rome. She knew she was ready. She was on point. She went on to win the 100-meter dash, the 200-meter dash, the 400-meter relay, becoming the first woman to win three gold medals, and she did it all in record-setting time. She absolutely knew her victory would be hard fought and hard won, but she didn't let her obstacles overcome her. She reached down. She relied on the faith that her Christian mother had instilled in her. She continued on fighting, training, running until she achieved her victory. In the Christian life, beloved, we too will have to fight. We too will have to train. We too have to run the race that is set before us to achieve victory. The victory of being a mature disciple of Jesus Christ, of glorifying Him in everything we do. Life is going to throw many curves at you. Satan is going to hit you with everything he has. Doubt and fear will begin to creep in, but we continue to fight We fight, we fight until the victory in Christ is won. Until Satan is defeated. Until temptation is slain. Until sin is put to rest. Until Christ is valued above all else. Until we are in heaven glorified looking at the Savior that we proclaim today. As we continue with our trip in Nehemiah, we're going to notice that he and the Jewish people at this point in time have achieved victory. In Jerusalem, they rebuilt the wall around the city. And looking at their victory, I want us to notice three things in this message today. One, we must continue until we have victory. We do not stop. As believers, we often short-sight ourselves and, and we think victory is here and now. We think victory is won in the current, beloved. Victory is not won until we get to heaven. So we don't stop. We continue to serve and grow in Christ and study the Word build ourselves up a disciple until victory is won, until we see the face of our loving Savior. So we continue on until victory. Second thing I want you to see in this passage, we must make the Word of God central in our lives. Before the battle, during the battle, after the battle. In every area of our life, the Word of God must permeate everything we do. Third thing we must remember as we continue to fight until victory is won, is we must stay humble in character and obedient to the Lord. So we think about this passage. Before we even jump in, I want us to consider a few questions this morning. What am I struggling with in my life that I need victory over? What am I struggling with in my life that I need victory over? I think a follow-up question to that is a healthy question in helping us answer that first question. Is the Word of God central in my life? Is the Bible central in my life? Or do I just pick it up on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights to come to church? Is the Bible central to my life? Am I humble and submissive to the Word of God? Have I given up in faith or in practice? Father, would you speak to us now by the power of your word and your spirit for your glory. For Christ's sake, amen. So just recapping chapter 5, because we ended on chapter 4, so I want to give you a recap of chapter 5. What happened in chapter 5, Nehemiah, they're building, they're doing their stuff. Uh, Chapter 5, Nehemiah finds out that the, 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 the haves... In Jerusalem, the the Jewish people, they're taking advantage of the have-nots and they're oppressing the poor, their own people, their countrymen in the city. And Nehemiah says, look, this is not going to happen. We're not going to do any of that. We're not going to have that. And they submit and they say, okay, we're going to fix the problem. And he handles handles the situation. He sets us up for chapter 6 through 9. And in verses 1 through 14 of chapter 6, Nehemiah discovers a plot. You remember your old boy, Sanballat? Well, Nehemiah discovers a plot by him. Nehemiah tries to, uh, Sanballat tries to lure Nehemiah out of the city. He tries to get him to come out of the city. He wants to kidnap him. He wants to murder him. Nehemiah hears of the plot, but instead of being scared, in verse 9 of our text this morning, in, in, in chapter 6, there's, there's a word, there's a phrase used that instead of being scared, instead of running off, it, it, Nehemiah is, is more greatly determined. 
He says he's even more determined. He has greater determination. So instead of running, when the obstacle comes, he has a greater determination to finish the call that God has on his life. We find ourselves in verse 15 this morning, starting our text. So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elu in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence. For they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The wall was finished. Praise God, it is done. In 52 days, they wrapped Jerusalem up. Remember the journey they had been on since we started with Nehemiah? Remember chapter 1? Remember he's there at the palace. He's doing his thing. He's a cupbearer to the king. And he hears news of his countrymen suffering. The city is in peril. The walls are torn down. The gates are in disrepair. He breaks down. For four months he fasts and he prays and he cries and he seeks the Lord. He goes to the king to ask the king for intervention. He, he gathers his supplies. He makes his plans. He takes the trip. He gets there and he, he surveys the city, if you remember, making plans all along the way, praying all along the way. He encounters opposition both within and without. He encounters the people that are broken and destitute. He encounters opposition that doesn't want him to regain or gain any traction at all. Time and again, the enemy strikes. Time and again, the enemy tried to sabotage and discourage him and the people in their work, but it did not deter them from their goal, did it? No, it did not. They continued on until victory. They came to complete the wall. They came to restore the gates. They came to give life back to their city, the symbol of their God and of their people. So after 52 days of busting it out, what seemed like a job that was impossible, what seemed like a job that would never be done. He rallied these people with no hope and no confidence. He relied constantly on God for wisdom and for strength. Now they have attained victory. And once the people, once their enemies heard of this, they lose their own confidence and they leave Jerusalem alone. They've won victory over the enemy. Isn't it good to have victory over the enemy? What about you this morning, church? You've been studying and praying and seeking God. You've been trying to understand God's Word for all of your life. You're seeking and you're struggling through the silence. You're trying to understand, you're trying to put in place, but it's not happening the manner in which you want it to happen. But do you give up? Never give up on God or His Word. We pray and we study and we stay faithful until God reveals His Word to us until it, it sinks in, until it plants itself, until it roots deep down in our hearts and begins to grow and flourish for the glory of Christ. Maybe you've been saving and putting back. You're struggling here and there. You've gone without. You've made personal sacrifices to be able to have financial freedom in your life and not be strapped down by debt so you can give more to God's work. But emergencies happen, don't they? Things come up. And it often seems that when one thing happens financially, it's another and another and another. And we have excuses not to serve and be faithful with our stewardship. But do we give up? No. We continue to give to God in the midst of trouble, in the midst of hardship. We prove God true in His promises. When Jesus makes the promise in Matthew 6, 33, He says, if you concentrate on My kingdom, if you make My righteousness central to your life, I promise you, you will not go without. And so you continue to serve and give. Maybe you've been doing all you can to make your relationship better. Maybe your friend or your sibling, relative, your spouse, to help that relationship honor God. But nothing seems to work. Do you give up? No. You decide that you're going to do what Christ calls you to do. You're going to seek Him. You're going to stay humble. You're going to obey the Word. You're going to rely on Him you decide that you're going to do what you're supposed to do and you're going to be an example to those around you, those closest to you. Work's been so hard. Over time, maybe kicking your tail. It's this never-ending grind sometimes, isn't it? It's so hard to, to go to work sometimes and every single person on the job site, every single person in the office is an opposite of you. 
You're the only one, it seems, trying to live for God. You're the only one trying to serve God. You're the only one. You're trying not to cuss. You're trying not to get involved in the office gossip. You're trying not to get involved in those conversations. And, and they pick on you and they make fun of you and they persecute you for your faith and for your obedience. But do you give up? No. We know that Jesus makes this promise. He says, if you live for me, the world will hate you. Notice what he says. He doesn't say if you give lip service to me, the world's going to hate you. He says if you live for me, if you follow me, if you're my disciple, the world will hate you. So we don't give up because we know in our struggle, in our persecution, in our embarrassments, in family functions, and at the job sites, and in the offices because of our faith, we know that we're identified with a Savior and that's a blessed thing to be. Maybe you've been serving God for a while now. You've sacrificed friends. You've trusted Him through thick and thin. You've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. The devil's attacked you more times than you can count. You may wonder if it's all worth it. You wonder if there will ever be relief. But do you give up? No. We continue on as children of God. We glorify by him. We serve others. We make disciples. We continue on until we're called on home to see Jesus. We continue. Never stop. We exalt Christ. We equip disciples. We engage a lost world. Why? Because that's what Christ called you and I to do, beloved. And as believers, we must know hard times will come. They're going to come in all shapes and in all sizes, last for all different periods of time. No part of your life as a believer will be free from hardships. God will stretch you and grow you. Satan will try to attack you. But we must remember, church, we don't follow Jesus just for the blessings. We don't follow Him just because times are good. We don't praise His name when everything is going our way. If we're going to be a disciple, we're going to follow Jesus up the mountain. If we're going to be a disciple, we're going to follow Jesus even into the valley. If we're going to be a disciple, we're going to follow Jesus no matter what until we have the victory. And the more we live for Christ, the more you grow for Christ, the closer you follow Christ, the more you make your faith known, guess what? The harder it's going to be because the devil will attack you more, the world will hate you more, they will ridicule you more. For many believers, there's going to be more bad than good. Most of us aren't going to get rich. We're not going to avoid sickness. We're not going to avoid family troubles, we're not going to avoid disease, we're not going to avoid death. But do we give up? Never. Because we know the truth of God's Word that through it all, Christ has never nor will He ever give up on us. We may struggle with sin you may have a certain temptation that's a thorn in your side all of your life. You conquer one addiction, one vice, one problem just to have another one come up in its place. But do you quit because you can't beat sin? No! We fight until the bitter end. I want to encourage you to never, ever give up. I'm, I'm encouraged if you got your Bible, if you want to flip over to Philippians chapter 3 with me right quick, we're going to do a little cross-referencing, if you will. One of Paul's most famous passages in Philippians chapter 3. And the Apostle Paul gives us these words, and, and these words I think are timely for us, church, today. Philippians 3, verse 12. He says, Not that I've already obtained it, I've already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that which was also laid hold of me. Paul says, I don't have it all together. Guess what? You're not going to have it all together. I'm not going to have it all together. We're not going to have it all together. But does that mean we give up? No. Paul says, I don't have it all together, but I'm going to continue to lay hold of that which was laid hold of for me. I'm going to continue to chase after Jesus because Jesus chased after me. 
Verse 13, Brother, and I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, the victory is not here. The victory is that upward call. Paul says, I forget it. I forget the failures. I forget the shame. I forget the guilt. I forget the victories that I've been living my life on for the past 20 years. I lay it all aside and I'm going to chase heaven with everything I have. I'm going to continue on to victory. And he gives us this word of encouragement, beloved. He says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. We continue until victory. We don't stick to the past. We continue until victory. And we too. We continue to victory. We continue for the goal. You say, what's my goal, preacher? Our goal, my goal, your goal is the same. It's Christ's likeness. You say, what's my victory, preacher? Our victory church is heaven. Our victory is heaven. It is not this world. It is heaven. This world is dead. This world is dying. That's why we share the gospel so that as many as us can go to heaven with us and have victory over death and this world. We continue on until victory. And in doing so, I want you to notice something else. We keep the word central in our life. Flip over from Nehemiah chapter 6. Flip over, skip chapter 7 and go to verse 8. We're skipping chapter 7 because it's, a, it's a, just a list of census of the people and appointments of leaders. So we see in Nehemiah chapter 6 that they continue on until victory. But it's really important to understand that as, as believers, as disciples, as we grow in Christ, that continuing on in victory means, has to mean, can only mean continuing on and keeping the Word central in our lives. Because if we get to a point in our lives where the Word is not central, guess what? We no longer have victory. Chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. When I was in high school, I played football, and uh, as a junior, I was chosen to participate in the senior all-star game, and uh, you know, that makes you feel good, right? Your head gets about this big. You know, John, you were talking about the other day in Sunday school, my head gets real big over all this, and, uh, and I got invited to a football camp uh, that summer, and I went, and I learned all these new fancy techniques and all this finesse playing, and I, I went from being an ugly football player, I was a pretty football player. I looked good with what I was doing in my head, right? And I remember my senior year, the first two games of the year, they wasn't that great. They didn't resemble the previous year. It was really weird. I, I wasn't doing that great. I was doing all these fancy moves. I was looking good in, in my outfit and everything was right. I mean, I was looking so sweet, but playing so garbagey. And I remember in, in, in the third game, our middle linebacker who I played with since we were freshmen, he grabbed me by my face, man. He said, Brad, he looked at me. You ever had somebody grab by face mask, you know, pull you in real tight like this? It's really intense, you know. He said, Brad, you are not a finesse player. You are a bull in a china shop. Just run. I said, yes, sir. And I didn't think that that was, I thought that more was a football thing, but the other day, me and Jackson were talking and we're talking, I was something in my truck when was, I messed it up, scratched it up, dinner or something. He said, Daddy, you're real rough on everything, ain't you? I said, not too rough. He said, he said well, Granny was telling me the other day that every vehicle you've ever had, you've torn up because you're rough on them. I said, me and Granny are going to have to have a talk. <laughs> but see, I had forgotten what made me play like me. 
I forgotten I wasn't a finesse player. I wasn't a fancy player. I was just a person who pushed people out of the way. And after a really good season, I went on to try to change and become something I wasn't. Instead of making me better, it made me suffer. You see, the Jews were in captivity for, because they forgot to do what made them a success. They forgot to make the Word of God central in life, which is why the position they're in now. They forgot what set them apart. The Word. They were known as the people of the book. But they had gotten away from the book. So much so that, that many of the Jews at that time, they couldn't even read Hebrew. They'd gotten away from their language. They'd gotten away from their identity. Ezra was bringing them back to the book. God promised them that as long as they would keep His Word central in their lives, as long as they followed it, as long as they obeyed it, He would bless them and make them a great nation. But after many victories, after decades and decades and decades of faithfulness from the Lord, they quit doing what they know would work. And they tried many new things. They got so far off of God's path for them that he had to carry them off to slavery in order to get their attention. And so when the victory was won, Nehemiah remembers all that past. He remembered they rebuilt the wall. He remembered what would happen. And so the people start getting feeling good about themselves. We have this small victory over the people. And so Nehemiah calls in his predecessor, Ezra, and he gets Ezra to read the law to make sure the people know that the Word is to be central in their lives. The law of Moses, the law which God gave to him on Mount Sinai, the law that made them different from everyone else around them, the law which, which made them abandon everything else, they abandon it for personal reasons, for personal riches, for selfish pleasures. This law that was forgotten is now brought back center stage and is given its rightful place as the center of their lives. And Ezra rose and all the people gathered and all he did for five or six hours straight was simply read the Word of God. Beloved, let me just ask you this morning, is the Word of God enough for you? If all we did was come in here, if we didn't have no lights, if the building wasn't here, could we gather down at the pond and just read the Word of God and that be enough for you? Is the Word of God central in your life? And notice what the text says. All the people were attentive. They listened. They understood. They were committed to the Word. I can't tell you the heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak that a pastor goes through, that a minister goes through, that you see people, young and old alike, they struggle through an issue, through a relationship, through a sin, maybe addiction, unemployment, jail, sorrow, loss, whatever it is. And during the time of their hardship, they are face down, prostrate before the Lord. They cry out to God. They draw near to Him. They pray to Him. They study their Bibles. They go to church, they're seeking God, but when the victory is achieved, when their problem is solved, when God blesses them, it's like they get spiritual amnesia and forget He ever existed. I can't tell you the heartbreak that causes a church. And so many of us, what happens is we get so used to playing and we get so used to doing our thing that we never jump back in once we get off of this spiritual train with God, we never jump back in the water, if you will. We, we stay on the dock and we never start, we never allow the Spirit of the living God to wash over us. We, we remove ourselves once we've gotten the victory. When we, we got to uh, the Wakirka's uh, lake house a few weeks ago, we were there three days. Jace did nothing but sit on the dock. Every other kid spent like every day, every waking hour in the water playing. Jace refused to get in the water. It was, like, it was like a curse or something. He didn't want to get in. Finally, he ended up in the water. I'm not going to tell you how he got there, but he got up in the water. He ended up, let's just say he ended up in the water. Come to find out, he loved the water. He's like a submarine in the water. I mean, he's everywhere. We couldn't keep him out of the water. He's trying to swim without life. He loved the water so much 
But it was before, before he got in the water, he didn't want to be in the water. But once he got in it, all he wanted to do was be in it. So many of us, what's happened in our lives, if we're going to be honest, if we're going to pull back the curtain a little bit this morning, many of us have gotten out of the water of the Word. We've quit allowing the Word of God to wash over our hearts and we've stepped back on the dock of life and we're just enjoying all the amenities that the shore has to offer. We forget what God has done for us. And beloved, may I remind you that God will get our attention. Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee President makes this statement. Ronnie Floyd says, If you fall away from the church, you will fall away from the faith. And I've been really struggling that, and my heart is breaking thinking about the future of the church in America right now with everything I read, all the studies I read, all the articles I read right now saying post-COVID, 20% of the church is not going to return. 20% is not going to return. That means we have 20% of the people who proclaim to have faith in Christ will not come back to the family of faith. But Jesus says in John 15, 5, He says, If you remain in Me, I will remain in you. If you abide in Me, I will abide in you. And through Me, there's nothing you can't do. But we're going to have a whole host of people that claim to be Christ that are not connected to the vine any longer. Beloved, we must not let that happen. We must not fall away. We must make the Word of God central in our lives. We must not forget that the only way we experience the blessings of Christ are through His Word. The Word has to remain central in our lives. We cannot get entangled and caught up in the sinful world of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes. In John Bunyan's famous book, Pilgrim's Progress, Christian is introduced to the man in the cage. He's an old man with a long beard and ragged clothes. He's sitting locked in this iron cage. And Christian asks the interpreter why the man's sitting there. And he tells Christian to go over there and ask him himself. And the man tells Christian, he says, I used to be a professing believer. I was zealous for the Lord. I was eager to learn more about Him. I had, jo I had hopes of, of, of joy of reaching people for Christ. Untold people for heaven one day. But I'm no longer such a man. I'm now held captive by despair, symbolized by the cage he's sitting in. Claiming he was unable to get out of this hopeless situation. Christian asked the man, listen to what he says, he says, how did you get in the cage? And the man in the cage responds, I neglected to watch and be sober. I loosened any restraint that had been on my lust and I gave them free reign. I sinned against the light of the Word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the Holy Spirit so that He has departed from me. I have provoked God to anger. Beloved, when you and I cease to make the Word of God central in our lives, we can only, only do one thing. And that's give in to the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. The man in the iron cage allowed sin to hold him captive and warp his view of God. And the same thing happens to us when we quit making the Word of God central in our lives. Let me ask you this morning, how do we view God's Word? How important is God's Word in our lives? Are we seeking after it like a starving man needing a final meal? Do you desire closeness with Christ? Do you yearn to know Him more and more? Do you cry out to have deeper intimacy today than you did yesterday? See, the value that we put on God's Word is not in our words, it's in our practice. We can say we treasure, we can say we love the Bible all we want, but it's our practice. We can say we want victory over temptation and sin. We can claim we desire God's wisdom in our lives. We can tell the world we seek to understand God's Word and we hold it high above everything else. But if we don't put it in the practice, all that's for naught. It means nothing. 
When we value God's Word, we make it central to our lives. We are attentive to it. As Ezra gathered the people, he read for five or six hours and they were attentive to the Word. Are we attentive to the Word of God in our lives right now? God's calling each and every one of us to grow in our walk with Him, to be disciples who make disciples, who, who exalt Christ, who, who come to, to, to be equipped in the Word and who go out to engage a lost world. Are we growing in the Word? Because we will only be as strong for the Lord. We will only glorify God in so much as we spend time in His Word. The Bible gives us strength in times of temptation, wisdom in times of confusion, courage in the face of fear, and hope even in the midst of death itself. We want to escape sin. We follow God's Word. We read, we repent, and we draw near to the Father, and we abide with Jesus Christ. Let me ask us a question this morning, beloved. Let's put the cards on the table. If you were only judged by your actions, what would your actions say about the value that you put on God's Word? Are we preparing for battle, for victory? Are we readying ourselves against temptation? Is the Word of God central in our lives? Skip over, if you will, with me to verse 1 of chapter 9. So the Word is going to stay central, but there's something important about this that we need to remember. Put your finger on chapter 9, verse 1, and then put another finger on chapter 10, verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. They gather together in mourning and in desperation before the Lord. And there's this whole huge long prayer of repentance. Very similar to what Brother James read in our time of confession out of Daniel this morning. There was a time of, of humility before the Lord. Let me ask you, beloved... Do you humble yourself before Christ daily? Might, might I remind us, it's, it's His world, not ours. It's, it's His will, not ours. It's, it's His Word, not our Word. So they're fasting in sackcloth and with dirt upon them because they're in lament and repenting of their sins. Now skip over to verse 28 of chapter 10. So they've made this big long prayer in chapter 9 and, and, they're getting, and they're getting the people ready. Now look at verse 28. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of their God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles. Listen to this and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. They made a commitment to walk in God's law, to obey God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and listen, to keep and to observe all the commandments of God our Lord and His ordinances and His statutes. Beloved, when, when, when God's Word is central to our lives, we will be convicted of sin. I'm, I'm convinced that the longer I grow in Christ, the more of God's Word I read, I see myself. The more I mature in Christ, the more I come to understand I'm much greater of a sinner than I ever knew. I'm, I remember one time I was starting to disciple this young man and he had been saved maybe, maybe six months and he, he had this one thing, he said, if I could just get over, if I could just get over my pornography addiction, I would be alright with God. My heart broke because I, I'm thinking, in one sense, that's a good thing to want, but man, you are way more wicked than pornography. And it's the humility of ourselves. It's, we see how holy, we see how righteous. We don't have to 
feign humility. We don't have to pretend to be humble because when the Word of God is central in our lives as disciples, and we're growing in wisdom, we're growing in understanding of God's Word. When the Word of God is central in our lives, we don't have to pretend to be humble. The Word of God will make us humble. We will see Christ as righteous. We will see Him as holy. We will see Him as Isaiah saw Him, high and lifted up on the throne with the, the veil of His train filling the temple. And we can do nothing but put ourselves at the mercy of His grace. And we realize that we humble ourselves before Him because we are great and mighty sinners. And we are in need of every ounce, every drop of, of mercy that He has, has to offer. And we see ourselves as completely and utterly dependent upon His Word for our very breath. Beloved, when the Word of God is central to our lives, we cannot help but be humble people. And when we grow in humility, we will absolutely grow in Christ's likeness because I really believe the more I study the Gospels, the more I read the Gospels, the more I pour over the life of Jesus, one of the biggest character traits that He displayed of anything that He had was His humility. And it's growing in that humility will grow us in Christ's likeness. And it is that humility then that turns to people. It was their repentance of sin that then gave them. They said, we will give all of ourselves to the obedience of your word. Because they realized, check this out, this is, this is really cool. If you don't hear nothing else, listen to this. Sometimes, for a lot of us, what we really need in life is, is what an old friend of mine, Doc Robson, used to tell me. Sometimes what, what we need in life, we just got to get over ourselves. It ain't about us. I was sitting in his office one day talking, and I was mad about something somebody had done. Uh, and he said, Brad, just shut up. He said, get over yourself. It's not all about you. You know, for a lot of us, making God's Word central to our lives, growing in humility and, and obedience to the Word. For a lot of us, it simply means that we just got to get over ourselves. And if we're going to be honest, a lot of us like ourselves a little too much. But we must remember, without Christ, there is no life. So we make the Word of God central. The Jewish people were humbled by God's Word. They saw their sin for what it was. They saw... God for His holiness and righteousness. They saw how much they needed the Word, so they made a promise to be obedient to the Word. What about you? Is there evidence of humility in your life? Is there obedience to God's Word in your life? Would you stand with me, please? As our band comes, in just a moment I'm going to pray. Three takeaways from our text this morning. We must continue on until we have victory. We must make the Word of God central to our lives. And we must stay humble and obedient to God. Let me ask you this morning, beloved. With everything else we've talked about this morning, is the Word of God central to your life? Because if it is, everything else will be in its proper place. If it's not, you can't do nothing on your own.